In this video, I'm bringing you with me on my wild, eye-opening and exhausting first 24 hours in Tunisia to share everything I saw, learned and ate while getting my first impressions of this amazing country. This is my first ever visit to the African continent and I just arrived off the ferry from Italy last night. On my first day here, I head out on the trail of a long forgotten ancient civilization, sample the local food, visit the traditional markets, learn one of the darkest historical facts I've ever heard and get up to a whole lot more. To warm me up for all of that, I have a little challenge for myself. I'm in Tunis, the nation's capital on its northern coast, and instead of just staying in my hotel on easy mode, I want to start the day off with a morning coffee that I order from a local cafe entirely in Arabic. Aslima. Aslima. Labis. Alhamdulillah. I need to eat uh, Kawa Express. Kawa Express. Kawa Express. Here. Okay. Easy. Merci. Okay, well, close enough. A little bit of English and a little bit of French later, I get what I wanted. And I call that victory. Feel free to subscribe, by the way, if you're a fan of trilingual catastrophes. At this point, I was pumped up to spend the first half of the day touring the historical sites in the area, with the last stop being the most unforgettable Roman ruins I've ever been to. Before we get into it, I'd like to say a huge thank you to FlexiSpot for sponsoring this video and for enabling me to edit it while standing up. Us modern humans spend an unbelievable amount of our lives sitting down, but we weren't built for this sedentary lifestyle, which is why I'm so happy to be partnered with FlexiSpot and that they sent me their E7 height adjustable desk. Using it to alternate between sitting and standing during the workday can help you to alleviate the health and posture issues that are linked to sitting for too long. And the big benefit that I didn't expect was how laser focused I am while working standing up. It's a completely different mindset from sitting down that makes me feel really productive. And I love that despite being a strong and sturdy high-tech product, it actually has a really clean design that fits into your home or office neatly. So get your own E7 height adjustable desk from FlexiSpot at the link in the description and thanks again to them for sponsoring the video. Our journey back in time starts up here on Bursa Hill in a part of modern day Tunisia that's now a normal place called Carthage. But Carthage used to be much more than just this. It was the seat of an empire. So why are most of the ancient sites you can visit in Tunisia today built by the Roman Empire? Who were the Carthaginians and where did they go? Well, as I would be finding out today, Carthaginians were merchants and such good ones that after they founded their city-state here in 800 BC on the very hill where I'm stood now, they enjoyed hundreds of years of amassing serious wealth, a big navy, and an even bigger desire to expand and take control of the wider Mediterranean, which is the exact type of stuff that doesn't happen in this neighborhood without attracting the attention of the big dog, or rather the big wolf with two people. Never mind. And yes, history professor Thornton is back. And yes, this will be on the test. Carthage and Rome went on to fight three wars to decide which of them was allowed to exist. And now that I was finally in Tunisia for the first time, I was really excited to be spending the morning retracing their steps and seeing how that went for them. It had been a while since I'd done a private tour and I was kind of skeptical, but my guide for this morning, Balik, was not just a good sport about being on camera, he also had the most infectious enthusiasm when speaking about Tunisia. This very small country, it has an immense history, a huge history. He seemed to be a very well-respected guy around here too, and after we waltzed in to our first archaeological site completely unchecked... <laughs> there's nobody here? No, there's nobody. You're just trusted to sign us yeah, both in? They, they know me. <laughs> Fair enough. They know me. I suppose it saves on paying staff, eh? Yeah. We went on a journey through time that explained the fate of the Carthaginians. First, from up here, a glimpse of peacetime Carthage when everything was going well for them, as revealed by these excavated remains of very spacious houses for those times with lavish private courtyards. First of all, at the first glance, you can see how big are the Carthaginian houses, which gives you a clear idea how the Carthaginian at that time, they were really so mm. rich. But of course, when you're questioning where an entire people went, the story doesn't remain peaceful for very long. And our second stop takes us into wartime, where Carthage's attempts to take the rest of nearby Sicily have poked the tiger enough and they find themselves in constant conflict with Rome. Part of their defense strategy involved constructing this huge artificial inland harbor where they could build up their navy in secrecy and with protection from the elements. 
Even today, when this looks like a random circle of water that's just a nice view for the luxury villas around the edge of it, it's still quite a sight, so it's pretty impressive to try to imagine it as the hive of activity that it would have been two and a half thousand years ago. Before coming here, I remembered Carthage only from such hits as Hannibal tries to invade Italy from the north by taking elephants across the Alps, so we already know that they were kind of an ambitious bunch. But being here on the ground and seeing the traces of the things they tried to do to establish dominance over the ancient world is really fascinating. But it's where we went after this that shows just how badly they were losing the battle for that dominance. Carthage lost the first two Punic Wars, each time accepting stronger sanctions as part of their defeat. So when it came to the inevitable trilogy fight, a Rome that was very tired of having to teach them the same lesson again was making it the most devastating and bloody war of the three, inflicting panic into the Carthaginians. We come to a cemetery littered with tiny gravestones, which I think nothing of at first, but I was about to learn the darkest part of all of this history. It's a cemetery, but a very particular cemetery since that it is a cemetery which is dedicated just for the babies. For oh. the babies, I mean, oh, wow. from one that day... bleak from, very quickly, very yeah, sad. <laughs> from one day until three, four years. And it is said that the Carthaginian, to ask the protection of their god and goddess to protect them, against their eternal enemy, Rome and the Romans, they will show their highest level of devotion to offer the best that they have, which is their children, as an offering. After the, the birth, the parents, they will take the child here or to the temple, they give it to the priest, the baby, and the, the priest, he will kill it, and he will Jesus. take the, yes, and he will take the blood and to spread as a way to easy or to satisfy their god bloodthirsty. Sorry, when I said it was bleak at the start, I thought I meant that this was a cemetery for sick babies who died no, young. No, 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 But no, that's no. even bleaker. That, no. That's worse. But Leith did go on to explain to me that that's only one theory and that infant mortality in the ancient world was just pretty bad anyway, but it is a sign of how desperately Carthage was losing. By 150 BC, Rome won the Third Punic War completing their hat-trick and ultimately deciding that they were the ones who were allowed to exist. As demonstrated by our next stop, the Romans decided to go scorched earth on them this time. Like, scorched earth, scorched earth. I promised you to show you the traces of burning Carthage. Yes. So, you see, this is the Punic cemetery, necropolis, and you see the black color on the top of the, the, yes. the tombs? These are the traces of burning Carthage. And it was burned by the yeah, Romans? by the Romans. Mm. And it were besieged for mm. 17 days. I mean, non-stop flames. So they burned their cemeteries. Yeah, everything. That's they pretty uh, barbaric of everything. the Romans. They put, they put fire for everything, everything. The jubilant and now almost competitorless Rome took all of this fertile land, enslaved the local population, and went on to do a whole lot more empiring in Northern Africa, leaving behind a lot that's worth seeing. Wow. People generally go to Italy or maybe southern France to see Roman ruins, but today I was reaping the rewards of going slightly out of my way to Tunisia to see awe-inspiring places like this theatre without seeing another soul there. And this still wasn't the coolest place that we got to see today. The Roman, they were influenced by the Greek people when they conquered them in 6th century BC, because they conquer, they invade Greece. The Roman. The theatre is the invention of the Greek. The amphitheatre, the Colosseum, mm. is the invention of the Roman. Ah, so they made it for violence <laughs> instead of plays and drama, dramas right and comedies. <laughs> you give me the right word. The, the International Festival of Carthage will receive groups from the whole world are played here on the stage. So there is a modern stage here. Yeah and you sit on the stone seats and watch. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. That's really nice. I like I mean, it. In Roman side, to see the modern performance. Yeah. A very good combination. It's definitely, yeah. It's like Pink Floyd playing Pompeii. Yeah. If you want, I take you a picture. Um, yeah, oh, yes, you will be on the podium and you perform for us. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> yeah. 
the comedy or the sound. So <laughs> this theater was impressive, and I low key have to come back to sit on these original marble seats and watch a show. But the most stunning evidence of the Romans and their later dominance in the area was waiting for us here at the Antonine Baths. Built over multiple levels and representing the largest Roman bath ever constructed outside of Italy, this place seemed like it was a city of its own back in the day, rather than a simple bathhouse. But one of my highlights of the morning was Belief's interpretation of how it got its name. I will start first of all mm. with this detail. Why we give it the name of the Antonine Bath, although the construction it was that it was initiated under the reign of the Emperor Adrian. It was inaugurated in 165 AD under the reign of the Antoninian Le Pieux. <laughs> like what is happening today. If we have two presidents, they will forget about the last one. Yeah, yeah, it, it, what I love in the history, the same things are repeating themselves. Just the technique and the ways is much more mm. modern. Mm. That's okay. Look at this. If you can see, DV Antonine, which means the god Antonine, because the Roman they consider their emperor as a god. That's mm. why it is written DV Antonine. This is so well preserved. This yes. carving, it's amazing. And quite different from Italy. You can't touch it. In Italy, you can't touch nothing. <laughs> In Italy, nothing you can touch. Okay, but is that good? Bad? They are very well spoiled. Yeah. Very well spoiled. <laughs> This is genuinely, like properly, properly unbelievable. Walking through the basement of an old Roman bath, the scale of everything and the history that's here, how amazing it looks under the sun as well, right next to the sea, except nobody's here. Like I've been to Italy and I've seen historical stuff in Italy before and it's crowded and it's a nuisance. This is just, yeah, I can't believe it. I'm just saying, I can't believe how, uh, how nobody else is here. Seems like it's just us. VIP. VIP, yeah. Because it's uh, the low season. After two weeks, it will be the high season. It will be completely crowded. Just seeing what remains of the baths and wondering what it must have looked like when it was functioning and full of people was pretty fascinating. But the most mind-blowing part of it all was probably actually seeing how they got it to function. The Antonine Bacchus. Mm. It was a huge battle, so they need to be supplied with water. And they built an aqueduct. And these are the remains of the mm. aqueduct Wow! root the water up here. This is just one small section of the 132 kilometer long aqueduct that they built to solve that problem. I can't quite comprehend how you would build almost 100 miles of this, or even one mile of this, without power tools. But apparently they did, and if you follow the path all the way up to the source, you'll find this shrine that the Romans built around the sacred life-giving spring. And if you look in there, you'll find a reminder to subscribe to my channel. Hey, crazy what the Romans left behind. By this point in the day, I still had the modern city and the markets in the Medina ahead of me, and already this whole morning had been a whirlwind of new places and new knowledge. Being driven around in northern Tunisia feels almost like going to a theme park for ancient history nerds. So if your Roman Empire is the Roman Empire and your idea of fun is visiting a place where you casually see priceless ancient artifacts out the window while sat in traffic, then so far I was feeling very happy to recommend you to visit Tunisia. I've even included a link to Belis tour company in the description. He hasn't paid me to, I just think it was a great tour and as you've seen in the video, he's a good laugh and you'll definitely want to come here to Tunisia when you see where we stopped for lunch, in the famous seaside village of Sidi Bou Said.
We're into Arabic era construction now and the buildings are so well maintained with their blue and white paint that the whole town is unbelievably picturesque. It's no surprise that this is where we see our first other foreigners of the day. A hot coffee overlooking the sea and this plate of Tunisian sweets, like this one, which is a type of semolina cookie filled with dates and almond paste, mm. was exactly what I needed after spending all morning in the sun thinking about wars and invasions and sacrifices. And the restaurant here was also so nice as to do a non-meat option for me that wasn't on the menu, where I hit all of the main carb groups in one meal. No complaints from me. Okay, no pitted olives here. I was awake again and refueled and ready to go back to Tunis itself, where Balik had promised me that if I follow him through the labyrinth-like markets in the old Medina, then at least I won't get lost, which, as I was about to see, would definitely have been a possibility on my own. First built in the 7th century during the Islamic conquest of the Maghreb lands, this entire place is now protected as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. I was pretty blown away by the fact that absolutely everything imaginable was for sale here. Not just the classic plates, spices and traditional clothes that all of the travel documentaries focus on, but also loads of normal everyday local shops and tourist stuff, including the obligatory Messi and Ronaldo shirts. All of which you enjoy only fleetingly, assuming you want to keep pace with the sea of people trying to go both ways through these insanely narrow corridors. But it's the overcrowded and bustling nature of these types of places that make them so special and memorable. At the center of the maze, you're rewarded with a view of the Zatuna Mosque, one of the oldest mosques in all of Africa. After my tour ended, I explored the modern part of Tunisia's capital by myself at Golden Hour, which was a lovely experience. Absolutely exhausted, but still trying to soak everything in and see as many corners of this place as I could. Modern Tunisia gained its independence from colonial France in the 1950s, but its path to being the democracy that it is today required one more coup in the 1980s and another revolution in 2011. This evening in Tunis, I had very visibly gone back to being the only foreigner around and I was attracting some attention, but that's okay. Nine out of 10 people were friendly and I mostly felt very safe. Wandering around and enjoying the wonderful mix of European and Arabic influences that have blended together to make this style of city. As it began to get dark and I headed back to my hotel room, I knew that I just about had the brain power left and had the Tunisian currency left for that other important thing to do on your first day in a new country. Seeing what's on offer in a local supermarket. So I went into Carrefour, which you'll probably recognize as a French brand, which explains why it's mostly full of cakes and eclairs and breads, a lot of different types of cheeses, of course a lot of dates on offer, and I didn't buy them by the branch, but I couldn't resist getting a pack just to try while I'm here. A huge selection of sweets and biscuits, some that I recognize as international companies and some that I don't. Le Confiture, including this honey with nuts in it and a lot, really a huge amount of different varieties of harissa that you can buy. At which point the security in the store came over to me and told me that I wasn't allowed to take photos in there, which is fair enough, I guess. Ah, <sighs> what a day. Amazing. I'm so lucky to have this experience. And with that, my wild first 24 hours in Tunisia drew to a close. And I had to get some sleep because at 5 a.m. sharp, I attempted to travel through the entire country on multiple trains. 
some of which even had doors. Subscribe to the channel so you don't miss all of that madness in the next video and thanks again to FlexiSpot for sponsoring this one and allowing me to edit this entire journey through thousands of years of history without even developing any back pain. Marvellous. Neither Roman nor Carthaginian. Oh right, the cathedral here? Yeah. It's uh, uh, Byzantine? No, no, it's French one. It's French? Yeah. Oh, even worse. If <laughs>